don't know. My name is Hannah Young, and I am the Public Policy Manager at Nonprofit Association of the Midlands. And we are excited to kick off this public policy winter series we have going on. We have partner partnered with Coalition for Strong Nebraska this year to bring six really exciting trainings that will span from December to February. In the wrap up email, I will send those out individually if anyone is interested in, in signing up for any more. But we are going to include Advocacy 101, Advocacy 201. We're going to do one specifically on public loan student forgiveness, one on the 2020 census now that it's wrapped up what does that mean and then also in that will be redistricting and gerrymandering we're kind of partnering those together and then we will also be doing one on grassroots advocacy so how to get your constituents and your volunteers involved so something we're really excited and looking forward to and if you i will turn it over to renee fry with open sky policy institute if you have any questions throughout this please put them in the question and answer and i will moderate that throughout this so thank you so much renee and thank you so much for continuing this partnership even in this virtual time so we really appreciate you thank you so much hannah and thank you um, for hosting uh, this event and um, for all your past partnership and to csn as well um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, so just a little bit of context um, for those of you who are not familiar with Open Sky Policy Institute. I'm the executive director. Um, and we believe that the best choices are informed choices. So we really work hard to make sure lawmakers and other leaders have access to quality data and research to help make decisions that help our communities thrive. Um, we are a nonpartisan organization and we focus on tax and budget policy as well as education finance in Nebraska. So today um, we are gonna talk about the budget outlook for the upcoming legislative session. Um, there is a tax proposal that we are concerned about that we're gonna share with you uh, what we know about it. Um, and then we also will talk about some other items in the 2021 session that you might wanna be aware of. So I'm gonna turn over the budget portion to Alex Serrurier, who is one of our um, policy analysts and he is going to walk you through the budget proposal. Awesome. Thank you, Renee, and, and thanks to NAM and CSN for hosting this. So what you're looking at on this slide is the current fiscal year's budget in Nebraska um, broken down by its major components. And so probably the first thing that jumps out at you here is that healthcare and education together comprise a little over 80% of our state budget. So we kind of like to open with this when talking about the budget because it emphasizes why uh, we talk so much about healthcare and education in budget conversations because those are the areas that feel budget reductions or cuts first and, and, and feel them hardest. Um, so we feel like this really illustrates that context. And so if you look at um, appropriations over time as a share of the Nebraska economy, uh, you'll see a general trend downward. And uh, fiscal years 22 and 23, so the upcoming biennium, uh, is shown with the dashed line at the end. And it's important to note that not only are we seeing a downward trend of, of state spending as a share of an economy, but we're actually projected to drop below uh, the levels that we were at around the Great Recession and in the late 2000s and early 2010s. So obviously the budget hasn't been set for the upcoming biennium. Those are just projections, but it's something we'll definitely be keeping an eye on as, as the legislature forms their budget for the upcoming biennium. And so what you're looking at now is the previous slide broken down into uh, the major budget components. And probably the, the most notable thing about this is that K-12 education spending is the share of, an eco of the eco Nebraska economy is declining um, the most out of all of these categories and is the primary uh, driver of the decline that you saw in the previous slide. So. Again, that's something that we're keeping an eye on as, as the legislature forms its, its budget for the upcoming session and um, just seeing where these trends lead, but based on total appropriations um, that are projected as shown on the last slide, we're, we're expecting these lines to sort of continue trending downward. If you could go to the next slide, please. So 
Sorry, Alex, for some reason, here we go. No worries, thank you. Um, so a couple of general notes about the outlook of Nebraska's budget. So at Sine Die 2020, which was the end of the 2020 legislative session, uh, we were seeing a massive projected budget shortfall of almost $800 million. Uh, however, revenue in the first four months of fiscal year 21 has come in above what um, people were expecting. So we're seeing the current projected uh, financial status down to about, a, about 170 million projected shortfall, which is still something to keep in mind in, in a point of concern, but much better than the $800 million uh, shortfall that was projected over the summer. A note on this though is, like I mentioned, it's been driven by revenues coming in before uh, above what was forecasted. So this 170 million is, is far from set in stone. We could see revenues continue to come in above forecast. We could see them start coming in below forecast. So it's something that we'll definitely have to keep an eye on and see how the shortfall uh, develops and changes as, as uh, lawmakers formulate their budget. One final note about uh, something we're keeping an eye on is that 1107, LB 1107, the grant compromise that was passed by lawmakers in the 2020 session is uh, exacerbating budget issues a little bit. And, and I'll get into that a little more on the next slide. So what 1107 did among other things was introduce a new business incentive program in the form of the Imagine Nebraska Act, uh, a economic development initiative for the University Medical Center. Um, but the portion of 1107 that will have the most immediate impact on the budget is the Property Tax Incentive Act that uh, was passed in the form of a refundable income tax credit against school property taxes paid. And so this credit is going to cost the state at least $125 million in years one through four, which are fiscal year 21 through fiscal year 24. And that credit will grow to $375 million in fiscal year 25 and then increase by uh, the statewide growth and valuation for each year thereafter. And so the note about the $125 million um, in years one through four is that in years two through four, that's just a minimum. So the credit can grow based on um, Nebraska's year over year revenue growth. If revenue growth is above three and a half percent in years two through four over the prior year, then you'll see a triggered increase in the credit and uh, it will start costing the state more each year. And so how is this trigger playing out so far? Well, it's already getting kind of complicated. So many of you probably remember that the state, um, that Nebraska, along with most other states, delayed its income tax uh, collection deadline in 2020. So, Income taxes are normally paid in April, but in 2020, they weren't collected until July in Nebraska. Because the fiscal year ends in June, that meant that the income tax revenue that was supposed to come in in April or fiscal year 20 actually ended up coming in in July or fiscal year 21. And so that equated to about a $280 million revenue shift from fiscal year 20 to fiscal year, 20, uh, to fiscal year 21. And so, we see revenue projections for FY21 um, artificially inflated because of this deadline and uh, artificially deflated in FY20. And so what does this mean in terms of the credit? Like I mentioned, the trigger, uh, the credit growth is triggered by a three and a half percent growth in revenues. So because this shift meant that FY21 revenues are going to be so much higher than FY20 revenues, uh, we are currently projected to see the credit increase to $212 million um, starting in fiscal year 22. Absent this change in the tax filing deadline and the, the shift in revenue between fiscal years, the credit would be remaining at $125 million. Another thing that we're thinking about in terms of LB 1107 is that it was, it's mostly unfunded. It was passed with very little uh, to pay for it. And the fiscal note has pegged the 11 year cost um, of the bill at $4.6 billion. So it's something we're thinking about when, when that's projected to be the cost over the next decade or so. And uh, as of now, we don't have many new revenue streams to be able to fund that. 
Um, it's also worth noting that the projected shortfall that I mentioned earlier of 170, 170 million dollars in the upcoming biennium would be a surplus without uh, 1107's passage. So the credit currently is projected to jump uh, to $212 million in FY22 and FY23, and then to increase to $394 million in FY24 under current revenue projections. Hey, Alex, there's a quick question. Totally. Um, I, you touched on this a little bit, but I just wanted to make sure it was fully answered. Any sense of why revenues are coming in above projections in early FY2021? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question, and, and there's no hard answer, but really across the board, um, projections were pretty dire at the beginning of the COVID-19 recession, um, and most states, in particular Nebraska, haven't been hit as hard um, as economists initially projected they would be. Um, there's a lot of theories about this. Online sales tax has been a, a, a huge boon as people shop more online instead of shopping in person. Um, and just replacing day-to-day -day spending of going out to restaurants or eating out with um, spending in other places. So it, it does seem like people are still spending and still um, bolstering the economy just in different places than they were before the COVID-19 pandemic. But it's a really good question and one that I think people will continue to try and answer as we go forward through the pandemic. Alex, if I could just interject for, for a second, I think another, um theory is that a lot of folks didn't travel this summer and so they weren't they're still spending that money as you said and we've seen the sales tax receipts have been well above projections so instead of spending money to travel people are spending more money at home um, is sort of what we're seeing that's another really good point um so if we another thing that lb1107 did was set a floor on the existing property tax credit program that's been in place for a few years so now that we know that there's a floor of $275 million on that program, um, if we start adding that to the projections um, of future refundable tax credits from LB1107, we start seeing that uh, property tax relief is going to be a huge portion of state spending in coming years. Um, as this slide notes, it's projected to be almost 13% of total general fund appropriations by FY24. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind about how that's growing in, in the total state spending and state budget. So a, a few more notes on the budget that lawmakers will need to pass in the upcoming session. Um, right now, spending growth in upcoming biennium is projected to be 2.4%. And in the following biennium, which is fiscal years 24 and 25, we are seeing a projected surplus um, for the budget for that biennium. However, this surplus is based on revenue projections um, that have revenue growth for those years averaging almost 7%. And so why this is the case is that when projecting revenues that far out, the fiscal office will use whatever percentage revenue growth brings a five-year average to 4.5%, which is what, about what we've seen historically. And so because we're seeing smaller revenue growth during the COVID-19 pandemic with that formula, um, revenue growth that far out is projected to be high. So this is potentially unrealistic. Of course, it could come to pass, but if we don't see uh, project, uh, that projected revenue growth coming to pass, then the surplus that's currently being shown for that biennium becomes pretty precarious. Additionally, we are supposed to get a cash reserve fund deposit this year. Um, at the end of this year, but it will still have us below where we want to be um, in terms of our cash reserve fund balance. So the Legislative Fiscal Office recommends that Nebraska's cash reserve fund should be about 16% of its revenues. And while with the upcoming projected deposit, we're getting closer to that, um, we're still not up to that ideal benchmark. And uh, furthermore, 1107 will make it harder to set aside money for the cash reserve fund in, in future years. So we really want to be able to, to build up to that 16% uh, going forward and keep putting money in. So some final notes on the budget. Um, the TIOSA or school funding, K-12 funding um, for fiscal year 21 is less than it was in fiscal year 20. There's a 1.3% decrease and it's projected to grow in the next biennium. But of course this growth isn't set in stone and is subject to change based on what um, 
revenues and budget capacity look like at the point that lawmakers are, are deciding to formulate their budget. Um, furthermore, growth in state aid is going to be is pretty modest in FY22 because of residential and commercial valuation growing, which uh, means more resources for schools in equalized districts. Um, and a final note on this, the, the cost growth factor, which is part of the state's school funding formula, uh, has dropped to four and a half percent in the current year, but is projected to return to five percent going forward. And I'll turn it back over to Renee to talk about the upcoming tax threat. Great, thank you. That was great, Alex. Thanks so much. Um, um, Heather, Heather, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if they're for Alex or you, whoever wants to answer them. Um, do you have any idea if farmland values are projected to increase, decrease, or stay the same for the next year? They are projecting to be to decrease slightly. Okay. Um, why is Nebraska tag tagged as a high tax state by legislative leaders? What is the source of the characterization and is the source credible? What is Open Sky's views of Nebraska as a high tax state? I know this is one of my favorite questions. Alex, you want to take it? Sure. Um, I think a lot of the impression of Nebraska being a high tax state comes from our property taxes. Um, I'm sure you've all heard a lot about Nebraska's property taxes and are experiencing them, but we are, um, we usually hover around a top 10 state for property taxes paid as a share of our economy. And so I think a lot of frustration over property taxes and being a high property tax state drives that narrative. But really, if you drill down into how much um, sales and income tax Nebraskans are paying as a share of the Nebraska economy to be able to put it in comparison with other states, we're a relatively low sales tax state and a middle to low income tax state. So I do think that narrative is driven a lot by the high property taxes. But if you look at different tax revenue streams, it, doesn't necessarily hold water across the board. And Alex, on property taxes, we rank what usually 10 to 12th, somewhere in yep. there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. One more. Um, what will the school tax prop what will the school property tax credit mean to Lincoln homeowners, if you guys know that much? Do you remember that, Alex, off the top of your head? I can't remember off the top of my head, but we did um, look into that. Do you, if you wouldn't mind, could you see if you could find that number while, and yeah. we can come back to that at the, when I'm done? Absolutely. All right. And that is all the questions for now. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Hannah. All right. So I'm going to talk about um, this tax threat that we're expecting in the 21 session um, using some visuals. I thought that this was um, a pretty good way to to kind of look at the issue. Um, we are hearing, and I'm gonna go into some more detail about a pretty big um, tax threat or a tax shift proposal um, that would end up being a, a tax cut for pretty high income earners. Um, and to the extent it's not fully paid for could then again, result in budget cuts. Um, again, um, you know, I just think the moment that we're in, um, with this pandemic, uh, and I thought particularly since we're talking primarily to um, folks that work in the nonprofit um, industry, I wanted to lift up for you, um, you know, the pandemic has been hard on families. And I think, you know, Nebraska's revenue, as we talked about, hasn't been as dire as a lot of other states or as was projected, um, but that doesn't mean families aren't struggling. And so um, I found this comparison that really struck me. So you had Bloomberg with almost 30 million um, families in the US didn't have enough to eat, um, while billionaires in America um, have made an average of 42 billion a week throughout the pandemic. Um, and all of this is um, really exacerbated by our tax policy. Um, in the United States and our tax policy at home. Um, likewise, income inequality is at the highest level in 50 years. Um, again, um, this just reinforces what we saw on the prior slide. Those at the top are making more and more money um, and families are struggling to put food on the table. Um, so this is a real problem, again, um, that is really exacerbated by our state and um, federal tax policies. Oops. So um, as Alex said, um, 
Last session, LB 1107 um, passed, which is expected to pay cost um, 4.6 billion over the next 11 years, which is a real, really a huge, huge number. And so for, again, those of you who work in nonprofit and maybe um, advocating, I know um, Hannah mentioned that there are some, going to be some upcoming sessions on advocacy. Um, I just contrast that 4.6 billion with other things that I know a lot of you are advocating for different policies um, that would help um, folks that um, you serve. And so, you know, there are some opportunity costs um, certainly, as Alex said, we, we rank 10 to 12% on property taxes, and that is an issue um, that people in Nebraska feel very passionately about um, trying to get those numbers down. Um, but that there is a trade-off there, right? So there's less funding for things like um, quality pre-K or EITC paid leave, all these things that um, you all um, care about to help the families that you support. So the tax threat in 2021 that we're expecting, um, Blueprint Nebraska commissioned a report from the Tax Foundation. Um, the Tax Foundation has done reports for Nebraska in the past um, and their recommendations were very similar. Um, there was a Platt Institute webinar a couple of months ago that highlighted the Tax Foundation's recommendations. And so that's sort of what we're expecting. Um, details are supposed to be out sometime in December, um, but at least looking at the recommendations um, of from the Tax Foundation, we, can, we know a few things. So um, it appears that, again, these are the recommendations made by the Tax Foundation that they're proposing we cut the personal income tax rate, um, we cut or eliminate the corporate income tax, um, we stop state taxation of international income, we broaden the sales tax base. Um, there was mention that it sounds it's likely that they would propose um, taxing groceries. Um, and then they talked about reducing the property tax burden. Um, and um, at least in the webinar, there is discussion about reducing the property tax burden by capping local spending growth. So this would really limit the ability for education and other local services. Um, they would be capped, have additional spending caps, um, and so would limit their spending, um, which is particularly the timing of that in the middle of the pandemic, um, especially when you think about um, like community health care um, and education and the challenges that they're facing right now. Um, but we would expect to see um, this proposal include some sort of additional caps for um, local governments. So in terms of this tax threat, the personal income tax, as I said, they're um, they propose or recommend cutting the top personal income tax rate. Um, the personal income tax is the most progressive store, source of state revenue. So wealthy Nebraskans pay the most. They pay a higher percent of their income and income taxes than low and middle income families do. So it would cut, it would reduce um, how much they pay in taxes. Um, but the sales tax is the most regressive. Um, so um, low and middle income families pay a higher percent of their income in sales taxes than um, wealthy families do. So again, what we're talking about is cutting um, a tax on high income earners and replacing that with a tax on low and middle income families. So what we would expect to see with this combination is that we're gonna raise taxes on low and middle income families while cutting taxes for the wealthiest Nebraskans. Um, what we don't know yet is whether the proposal will be revenue neutral or whether um, the sales tax base expansion would fully pay for the tax cuts at the top. Um, if it's not revenue neutral, then it will require budget cuts. Um, and again, we're really concerned about this, especially um, on top of um, LB 1107, which passed last session, and as we talked about, has a pretty significant um, financial obligation now and to the future that's largely unpaid for. So just an example of what this might look like. This was a bill from several years ago. Again, we don't have any of the details of this particular proposal yet. Um, so these are just based on the broad strokes um, of cutting um, the top income tax rate and broadening the sales tax base. It could look something, the trend will look something like this, um, where you see uh, tax increases for the 80% of Nebraskans and the wealthiest 20% percent 
see a pretty significant tax increase. Again, um, it's not gonna look just like this. Um, it'll be some variation of this chart depending on um, the final details of the proposal. I had one question, Renee. Sure. Uh, what organizations were behind your last slide or is there a particular Senator? Um, I don't know. So, um, so Blueprint Nebraska, um, was who was the organization that requested the recommendation from the tax foundation um if you remember former senator jim smith is the executive director for um, blueprint um i know senator lanahan was part of that um, webinar and she i think at least seemed supportive of the proposal but i'm not sure and haven't heard who might introduce it and who all will support it um, at this point. So those details are still sort of unknown. Great. Thank you. So the bottom line on this um, tax cut proposal is that the state depends on income tax revenue to fund schools and healthcare and corrections and um, all of those services that low and middle income families rely on. Um, this plan is likely to increase taxes on low and middle income families. Um, it's likely to reduce future revenue. Um, um, which would threaten funding for education, healthcare, and other critical services, um, and also limit the state's ability to fund new programs. So again, to the extent that this isn't fully paid for um, and there's future revenue that would be taken up by this tax threat, um, that means the state will continue to have to cut the budget year over year and look for ways um, to, to close that, to balance that budget. Um, Again, we think it's likely to include spending restrictions for schools, um, local health care, and other services that low and middle income families rely on. Um, we also know that BIPOC communities are likely to be hit hardest just as they were in this pandemic when we look at the breakdown um, of income among, by, uh, among um, BIPOC communities. We would see that they tend to, um, tend to be low to middle income um, and wouldn't benefit from the tax cuts to the same to the extent that white families would. So we need your help. Um, we're really hoping that those of you who um, are concerned about um, about having services for your families um, that you serve, um, we would encourage you to engage the legislature um, on this proposal and raise concerns. Um, uh, you know, raise your concerns. So how can you help? You can testify, you can write letters, um, you can contact your senators, you and your board of directors, calls to action, you can share social media posts. Again, once we have more details about the proposal, we'll be putting out a lot of data, um, public pulse letters, um, and collect and share stories, which is really helpful about what the impact is to the families that you serve. Um, so one thing that I would say is you don't need to be an expert in tax policy to engage on tax policy issues, right? Um, and we aren't, you know, we don't interact with, um, we're not a direct service provider. So we don't have access to a lot of those stories. We can just see what those numbers are and in broad strokes talk about how impact state services or particular families, but um, we really need others, we need um, you folks, if you're concerned about it, to share stories and, and connect the dots with why this change in tax policy would concern you and your organization and the people you serve. So I hope that you'll take this seriously along with us um, and we'll certainly be putting out more information as, a, as it's available, um, but don't be intimidated just because it's a tax issue. I would say that's, um, you don't need to be a tax policy expert um, you just need to be able to connect the dots for senators about um, why this would hurt families that you serve. So I just want to touch on um, a couple of other items for the 2021 session. Um, so it's, uh, it is the first year of a biennium, so we will have um, legislative leadership elections um, in and that should say, um, yeah, in 2021, um, in January. So um, right off the bat, and um, we will have those legislative um, leadership elections. Those will really set the stage, I think, for the tenor of um, the session. Um, in 2017, there was um, a, a lot of folks, there were, um, lost their leadership positions and there was a, a rules fight that lasted 30 days and it was a pretty contentious session. Um, so I think once we see what happens with those elections and then whether there's a rules fight or not, um, there are um, this 
this um, upcoming um, legislature will have 17 um, Democrats, which is how many it takes to stop a filibuster. Um, and we have, uh, or, yeah, to stop a bill, excuse me, to filibuster a bill. Um, and um, we have, it's a redistricting year, as Hannah mentioned that earlier as well. And so um, there may be an effort to change um, the filibuster number or change, we've heard some discussion that maybe not changing the number, but, in, but now it's incumbent upon 33 senators to make sure that there are 33 no votes. We've heard that it's possible that that would change, um, that those 17 um, would all have to be present um, to be no. Um, so putting the onus on the 17 rather than on the 33 um, is something that's being talked about as a possible rules change. So, um, but certainly the, the rules fight, the leadership um, will all um, really tell us a lot about whether it's going to be a more collaborative or a hyper-partisan um, legislature next session. And again, with redistricting, um, there's a lot at stake. Um, so, so it'll be interesting to watch that first day to see um, how we think the rest of the session will play out. Um, as I mentioned, I think um, local spending limits will be introduced, either part of this big tax threat package or separately um, in an effort to keep property taxes down. Now, all local governments already have spending caps, um, but we would expect to see additional spending caps on those local governments, um, cities, counties, um, schools, et cetera. Um, we also expect to see some school privatization efforts this next session. Um, the, um, there were a number, of, or there was a lot of money um, coming from out of state um, school privatization organizations um, into elections um, in Nebraska this year, um, much more than uh, in prior years. So we think that that could signal um, more of an effort to focus on Nebraska for school privatization. Um, and then I would just flag, you know, corrections continues, we continue to have overcrowding issues. And I just flag abortion um, because again, um, these issues are all contentious and they will flow over into um, the entire um, tenor of the legislature. And so even though you may not work on these issues, they will affect, um, I think, just the tone um, of the body. So that is our presentation. And um, so Hannah, I saw that there were some other um, yeah. questions popping up. Yep, we have quite a few questions. I went ahead and just kept the rest to the end um, since we had quite a few coming in. Um, people really loved your graphics first. Um, um, many legislatures want Nebraska to have a state policy, state tax policy more like Texas. Do you know what the mix of tax, taxes in Texas are? Um, Texas doesn't have an income tax, um, so that's a big one. Um, so they rely really heavily on sales tax and property tax. So um, again, what you would see then is a much more regressive tax system in, in Texas than we have in Nebraska, um, because our, our income tax in Nebraska is pretty progressive. Um, so our tax code in Nebraska is still regressive all, overall. So it still does, you know, low and middle income families do pay a higher percent of their income in total taxes on Nebraska. Um, but if you take income taxes out of the picture then, um, and you rely on sales taxes, which are fall very heavily on low and middle income families, and then property taxes tend to be sort of regressive on the ends and proportional in the middle, you're creating a much more regressive system. So in, in Texas, low and middle income families um, pay a much higher share of their income in taxes than we do in Nebraska. Alex, would you, do you have anything to add? No, that's right on. I mean, the no income tax state is, is a big one. Like that's a huge revenue stream for most states. And so they have to compensate for that with, with other forms of taxation. Okay, thank you. Um, where can someone find templates to help? I think when you suggested all of those actions, is there any place you can find templates to help? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think, um, we will be putting out a lot of information that organizations can use. Um, I'm not sure if Lori and Joe, um, I think they will be doing some communicating through um, CSN, but um, once we have more detail, we'll be able to share some information through um, CSN um, to get to folks that they can, they can utilize, utilize to engage on these issues. 
With the projected budget shortfalls, do you know if there's any appetite for and discussion around new revenue sources, such as increasing alcohol and or tobacco taxes? So, um, you know, there have been several bills in the past um, that would have raised um, tobacco taxes. Um, I don't know if anyone's going to be bringing one this next legislative session. It seems like if there was um, if there was any sort of tax that lawmakers would be willing to increase, that would be tobacco taxes. We rank very low. Um, I think the governor will oppose any effort to raise any kind of tax. Certainly there was a increase in the alcohol tax um, as part of some as part of a bill a couple of years ago and the, the governor beat up on that pretty hard and worked with the local breweries to um, really push back hard on that. Um, so I, I don't know that there is a lot of appetite. Uh, it sort of remains to be seen how, whether projections come in where they're expected to be now, 170 million again is much better. We were looking at almost $800 million shortfall um, prior to the last forecast. So 170 million um, is a little bit more manageable. It just keeps it just keeps that growth really, really low year over year um, and starts to fall behind, you know, needs. Um, so I'm not sure that the legislature will have much of an appetite, um, but okay. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Do you think a racial impact assessment on bills is likely to pass the rules committee? Mm, good question. Um, actually, I'm going to see if Joe or Lori um, have any information about an update on that. Uh, there was a bill last session, and there have been conversations. Um, I don't, look, Joe? Yes. Um, Senator Tony Vargas is working on introducing that again for the 2021 legislative session. Um, so every year we're hopeful that we can get something passed. Um, his effort is narrow around anything related to criminal justice or juvenile justice issues. So it wouldn't be broad enough for someone in education to look at racial impact. So it's, it's more tailored to the criminal justice system but we're hopeful that it could pass this session. And Joe, is he he's still planning on bringing that as a bill or is he gonna to try to make a rules change? You're muted. I think he's bringing it as a bill. Okay. Um, does, do you know if Texas has a corporate income tax? I don't think they do. They're one of the a few states that levy a gross receipts tax, um, which is slightly different, but there's no corporate income tax. Will the passing of the increased gambling in Nebraska, will those funds help with the collection of taxes specifically for education? No. <laughs> so uh, the proposal did specifically, well, 1107 earmarked those for property taxes specifically. Alex, do you have anything to add? I'm a little rusty on the details, but. I don't think so. Um, but I think the, um, trying to remember, actually it wasn't 1107. There was discussion about that being in 1107, but it was, I think the property tax ballot language itself. The it gambling? Is, yeah. Yeah, I, the, the gambling initiative language, I think it earmarked 75% toward property tax relief. In most so the of property the property tax credit program, I think, right? Correct, yeah. And most of most of that remaining part that wasn't earmarked for that is um, going to like a gambling addiction help fund. That's not the technical name, but is there likely to be a contest contest for the leadership of key committees like education? So I think that is um, evolving. Um, the latest that we were hearing yesterday, um, Senator Walls has um, put her name to run against Senator Groney, but it sounds like um, it's possible that another candidate might emerge um, 
to run for education. Um, so I think that that it's still very much sort of a moving target in terms of some of these leadership positions. But I do think the one that's most hotly contested at this point um, is probably um, is probably the education committee. Not hearing um, too many too much conversation about anyone challenging Senator Hilders for speaker or Senator Hughes for exec board. Um, so I, I do think education is gonna be the one to watch for. Nebraska has steadily reduced per capita general fund expenditures for the past 20 years. And your presentation seems to conclude that Nebraska will continue to reserve, reduce per capita general fund expenditures for the next 11 years. Is that true? Yeah, I think as a share of the economy, what we're gonna see um, is that our spending um, continues to decline. Alex, do you have anything to add? Yeah, just to clarify that uh, declining appropriations was as a share of personal income in Nebraska. So it was a more a share of, of the measure of the economy rather than the amount of people in Nebraska, which would be a per capita measurement. Um, but I'd assume that a per capita analysis would show something similar. Okay, and then the last question, um, can or will you share the third name interested in running for education chair committee? Um, I would, I'm not sure if I can. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> TBD on that one. Yes, um, and, and I, yeah, and I'm not sure how much of it is rumor versus, um, yeah, but. Totally fair. Um, how does Wyoming fund state spending? It appears they have income tax and low sales and property tax rates. Um, natural resources. I, I mean, I think severance taxes make up, it's been a while since I've looked at it, Alex. I don't know if you've looked at it recently. I think like over 50% of their general fund budget, I think. It's a significant number, significant reliance on severance taxes and we just don't have. And that's, you know, when we talk about whether we're a high tax state or a low tax state, I mean, we don't have a lot of those natural resources that other states have that they're able to, to tax. So one other thing that's interesting to look at is when you look at um, spending or spending compared to other states, we're actually a low spending state. Um, we don't get as much in federal funding. We don't have severance taxes. So um, again, when you compare Nebraska to other states on property, we're at that 10 to 12, um, much lower in sales um, and income. But then again, our spending is actually, we rank pretty low because we just don't have, um, we've chosen, I think, um, made policy decisions where we don't receive as much federal funding. Um, and then we just don't have the, the natural resources that some other states have, like Texas. I mean, that's also, you know, we could love to be like Texas, but we don't have oil, right? Um, not nearly to the extent that they do. Um, and so that is a big way that they fund their government in Texas. And we also and don't have, you know, we don't, it's, you know, how it's actually really nice here today, right? It's going to be like 60, but um, we don't have the weather that Texas has either. Someone mentioned that uh, Wyoming also has oil, so that would be a natural. Right. Yeah. And Hannah, could I jump in real quickly just to address the question that came up earlier about uh, Lincoln homeowner with 1107? Mm -hmm. So we did run the numbers on that, not specifically for Lincoln, but the average school levy in Nebraska is 84 cents and the median home value is $148,000. So if you base on 125 million credit off of those two numbers, if you have a levy of 84 cents and a home value of a little less than $150,000, you'll receive $66 as a credit. Um, I know the, the uh, levy in Lincoln is higher than that. I, I think it's around 1.2 if I'm remembering correctly, but even with a levy of 1.2, at that median home value, you won't be receiving $100. It will be less than $100. Um, and I think something that I may have forgotten to note earlier is that this is actually in the form of an income tax credit. So you see that $66 as an income tax reduction, whereas your property taxes themselves will stay the same. 
Right. And this is one concern of ours is just the a lack of transparency, right? People aren't going to see their property taxes go down. Our ranking on property taxes isn't going to go down. It's the same, even though we're making this huge commitment um, to fund property taxes, 12.8% of our general fund appropriations. And that's, um, you know, again, people are going to see, as Alex said, they're going to, they may or may not notice that $66 reduction in their income taxes, right? They probably won't. Um, and their property taxes aren't gonna, aren't gonna change. Um, they'll probably you know, continue to go up um, slightly. Well, they'll go up in residential and commercial or could go up um, in residential commercial areas if your valuation is going up. Um, and uh, so there's gonna be a disconnect for folks um, around the lack of transparency on 1107. And um, that will be something I think at some point legislators will have to grapple with. Okay, we have one final question. Um, uh, they likely to immediately go into recess because of COVID. So um, there are a lot of rumors, um, a lot of speculation around this. Um, the last that we've heard um, from the discussion taking place is that um, they may try to expedite do, do hearings. I, I don't think that there is a whole lot of appetite for likely leadership to recess. Um, I think that there will be attempts to try to um, do things like, for example, um, if an organization were to put, um, to put out a letter that they could be on the committee statement. So trying to reduce the number of people who are coming to testify, um, they might, again, try to do, um, hear, start hearings a little bit earlier or um, have them, um, we've heard possibly morning hearings and afternoon hearings to try to put that into a more compressed time frame. Um, but I, I don't at this point, and unless you know the numbers change specifically, I, I wouldn't expect them to actually re, um, do leadership elections in recess. Lori, did you have something to add? I see you popped your lovely face. Uh, no, not to that, sorry. Yeah, I, I'm hearing the same things. Um, I, I don't think it's likely that they will recess, although I think many senators want to. Um, my best guess is that it will be business as usual. With some, with some modifications, right? Like being able to submit a letter and that puts you on the committee statement, which isn't the case right now. Um, Okay, I think that is all the questions that I have. So I just want to say thank you to Renee and Alex, and I will turn it over to Joe. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I think Lori has a uh, comment before I close this out. So go ahead, Lori. Thanks, Joe. And thanks, Renee and Alex. And just so everyone knows, we are the Coalition for a Strong Nebraska is planning to. Um, work with uh, Open Sky and um, be uh, able to offer some um, information and different ways to share information with um, all of you. So you can share with your clients and you can connect with your senators um, and uh, trying to figure out the best way to easily convey the messages that we wanna convey um, and um, just look out for that information. We'll be in contact with you. And thank you everybody for attending. Okay, hey, thank you, Lori. I just wanted to uh, mention that CSN has put together a sign-on letter that we will be sending to legislative leaders at the end of this week that is asking them to ensure that the public and nonprofit organizations and other individuals will be able to submit written online written testimony, given our world with COVID and um, the challenges being in a large land mass state to get to Lincoln in a, on a random afternoon or morning to give testimony as well as other, other individuals who are working or may have mobility challenges or access to transportation. Um, this would be a, a great option to be able to submit online testimony that could go directly into the bill file that would be available 
on the website where bills are listed, not only for the public, but for senators to take a look at and to see what type of input members of the public may have. So um, check your emails either from CSN, NAM is going to send something out tomorrow morning. So if you're interested in having your organization sign on to that letter, um, just please get in touch with me and let me know that your organization wants to be a part of it and, and send your logo along. So um, that would be great. Uh, one other thing I wanna clarify is that Senator Vargas's racial impact statement um, proposal will be through the rules committee and not as a separate bill. Um, so then finally, we are so excited about this winter public policy series. Um, so we're grateful that you all logged on to our first uh, tax and budget webinar. And if you are energized and excited or you want to take part in advocating on any of the issues regarding budget or the tax threats that Renee and Alex mentioned, you want to come to our next advocacy training. So that'll be next week, Wednesday, December 16th, also at the noon hour. So this is Advocacy 101. So if you're new to advocacy at the state level or you want a refresher, the first part of the training will give you those basics to help you ease into advocacy. And then the second part of the hour, we'll talk about um, some specifics on do you need to register as a lobbyist in Nebraska? How will you track your time? Who do you need to report your letter writing? Or if you're going to testify in committee, you know, where, where, how do you track your time? What do you need to keep track of? What do you don't um, for reporting? So those are the two components. So you'll want to tune in for that next week. And then in January, we will have Advocacy 201 and we'll be talking about inside the Nebraska legislature. So we'll give you an update on what's happened with committee chair selections and um, hearings and some of the nuts and bolts about what's been moving and how you can engage in advocacy this session. And then we'll follow that up with grassroots advocacy. So you wanna be thinking about what you can do internally in your organization, and then what can you do to engage your clients supporters and community members about advocating on the issues that you and your organization care about. So that's gonna be a great training in our partnership with the Nebraska Civic Engagement Table. Um, and they've got a wonderful um, amount of tools and resources and um, communications that will help you reach your audience and figure out who you need to talk to and how do you talk to them um, and to engage them with some activating tools. Um, and then finally, we'll wrap up in February with um, how to use census data and redistricting and then public student loan forgiveness. So you can sign up for any or all of the trainings and we would greatly love to see you and bring your questions and we're happy to provide this information for you as you get ready to engage in a very important legislative session. So if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to reach out to us. And if not, we thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being with us today. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you. Thanks everybody.